Great finds in Straight Line Crazy by David Hare at the Bridge Theatre. George Bernard Shaw said in his play Man and Superman, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. In Robert Moses, we have the quintessential unreasonable man. David Hare's Straight Line Crazy begins in the 1920s when we meet Moses, an authoritarian figure with a vision of how New York should become the world's leading city. And, as he said himself, when you operate in an overbuilt metropolis, you have to hack your way with a meat axe. And hack he did, running his straight roads through whatever got in the way. Ray finds is the perfect choice as the bombastic, heartless Moses. It's a privilege to watch him perform as he strides the stage and often plants himself downstage, isolated from the rest of the cast, eyes staring, speaking in that slightly English way that many American patricians had last century, and in his case stem from the, stemming from the time, his time at Oxford University. But he's one, a one-dimensional character. We never really understand what makes him tick. We never see any doubts, any warmth, or indeed any feelings in him. Now, he may well have been like that in real life, but in a play, it's not very dramatic. Well, that's the one-minute review, but keep watching, because I have a lot more to say about David Hare's study of this strong man. The play's divided into two parts, and in the first, we see the appeal of the strong man. He won't compromise. He gets things done. We admire the way he won't kowtow to politicians or rich elites. He's non-partisan. He uses the law. And almost by the sheer driving force of his personality, he gets his roads built. Long, straight roads to carry working-class people, what we in the UK call middle-class people, newly liberated by cars, to the countryside. And he builds parks and pools and beaches for them to enjoy in their newfound leisure time. In many ways, he's a hero. And in the second act, at the end of his career, we're presented with the case against his single-minded, big-project approach to planning. In some ways, Straight Line Crazy is a history of the 20th century, the starting with the love affair with strong men, the Picasso type of artist, or the Mussolini style of politician, you know, who supposedly made the trains run on time. And then there was a reaction in favour of cooperation and collaboration, uh, more recently, there's been a bit of a return of interest in so-called strong leaders who get things done. So the play is timely. If you're unfamiliar with New York State, you may find it hard to follow what's going on. So let me help you. In the first act, Robert Moses, a public official who dominated urban planning from the 1920s to the 60s, is pursuing his first great project, which is to open up the peninsula of Long Island that juts out to the east of New York City and houses Brooklyn and Queens at its beginning, and the Hamptons at the far end. And that's home to some of the richest people in America. He wanted to create not only roads, but a public beach. In the second act, he meets his nemesis when, at the end of his career, he seeks to extend Fifth Avenue through one of the city's most beloved areas, Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. Now, the first act spends a lot of time establishing Moses' commanding personality. And there's some good dialogue, but not a lot happening. Some of the best moments come when Moses interacts with the lower-class governor of New York State, Al Smith, a wily politician who smoothed the way for Moses' projects in the early days. And the ever-reliable Danny Webb gives Smith a warmth that enables you to see why he was so popular and persuasive. Like others who know their own mind and are blinkered to other possibilities, Bob Moses is a bit of a monster. From the start, we get hints that there is a dark side to his character. The people around him work for him, not with him. Uh, early on, an employee alters a road design on the instruction of Governor Smith. Moses will have none of it. They're not there to have ideas, simply to carry out his vision. Act two is the case against Moses. Much more of his unsavoury side is revealed. He doesn't change. The world has. People power is growing. Jane Jacobs has a vision of revived, or gentrified we might say, urban areas. So the writing's on the wall for Moses. 
but he still refuses to consult or compromise. It looks like David here is setting up a battle between Moses and Jacobs, but a clash between two strong leaders wouldn't be appropriate. So although we meet Jacobs, acted with authority and humour by Helen, Helen Schlesinger, the play becomes a conflict between Moses and the people, a battle between two ages. Much of the talking on behalf of the community is done by Shirley Hayes, forcefully played by Alana Maria. So the rise and fall of Moses is interesting, but the fundamental problem with the play is that Moses doesn't change, except to get older. And it is fascinating to see Ray Fiennes change physically from the upright, vigorous young man to the slightly stooped and more ponderous old man. But there's none of the guilt and fear that adds depth to the single-mindedness of, say, Solness, the character Mr Fiennes played in Ibsen's The Master Builder, The Old Vic, in 2016. And that was an adaptation by David Hare. In fact, there are similarities between the two plays, but I'm afraid any comparison would be to the detriment of straight-line crazy. Unlike Solness, Moses' downfall doesn't come from fear or love or something within, but a much more mundane cause changing times and his refusal to change. However, by that time, he'd achieved so much of his vision and his place in history that it's hard to have much sympathy. The play doesn't take sides and we're left to ponder about the choice between strong leadership and people power and which, in the end, was more beneficial and which more damaging to the city. Bob Crowley's set underlines the debate by using a flat runway that goes from the back of the stage and thrusts out into the audience, like one of Moses' straight roads. And whenever we meet the protesting community, a wall is flown in that symbolically cuts right through the middle of it. And, in doing so, creates a less thrilling but more intimate space. Siobhan Cullen and Samuel Barnett play Moses' two assistants, the former extrovert and good-humoured, the other more shy and self-deprecating, but both in their defence of him, giving us an insight into why charismatic leaders attract a following. The younger and less compliant generation is represented in the second act by a new employee, played with passion by Alicia Bailey. Nicholas Heitner directs proceedings, as he seems to do most productions at the bridge. I mean, we can look forward to him directing The Southbury Child in the summer and John Gabriel Walkman in the autumn. It's not only his choice of plays that make him much missed at the National Theatre, uh, where he was once artistic director. His way of directing is unobtrusive and fuss-free. He puts the script and the actors centre stage, not for him distracting gimmicks or clutter, and he has the confidence of a modern strongman who doesn't need the production to be about him. I give Straight Line Crazy, starring Ray Fiennes, three stars. I hope you found this review worth your time. If you did, you can be the first to know about my future reviews by clicking subscribe down there somewhere. And please like, comment, share. Thank you for watching.